If it's Thursday, President Biden and Vice President Harris hold their first joint event since President Biden ended his re-election bid, appearing before an enthusiastic crowd with the feel of a campaign rally as they celebrated lowering prescription costs for millions on Medicare. Plus, former President Trump is set to take questions from reporters this hour one day after hammering Democrats on the economy and rising prices, while also lobbing the kinds of personal attacks on Harris that allies have been urging him to avoid. And an urgent round of ceasefire talks underway right now in the Middle East without Hamas officials at the negotiating table and with the threat of Iran retaliation still looming. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker. In just a few minutes, former President Trump is set to hold his second news conference in as many weeks at his Bedminster Golf Club. We will bring you that live when it begins. But we begin with President Biden and Vice President Harris holding their first joint event since President Biden stepped aside and Harris became the Democratic nominee. The two of them receiving a warm welcome from the crowd as they touted the administration's effort to allow Medicare to negotiate drug prices. Now, the White House today announced an agreement with drug makers to lower costs under Medicare for 10 common prescription drugs, which include medications for diabetes, heart failure, blood cancers, and more. Medicare was prohibited by law from negotiating lower drug prices. And those costs then got passed on to our seniors. But not anymore. Today, I'm proud to announce that Medicare has reached agreement with all manufacturers on all 10 drugs selected in the first round of negotiations. And although this was not a campaign event, President Biden delivered a fiery speech as he lauded his VP and pledged to take the fight to Republicans. Folks, I have an incredible partner. The progress we've made, she's going to make one hell of a president. You may have heard about the MAGA Republican Project 2025 plan. They want to repeal Medicare's power to negotiate drug prices. Let Big Pharma back to charge them whatever they want. Let me tell you what our Project 2025 is. Beat the hell out of them. Today's event comes ahead of Vice President Harris's visit to North Carolina tomorrow, where her campaign says she'll lay out her vision for the economy and call for a federal ban on corporate price gouging in the food industry. Yesterday, former President Trump held his own event on the economy, also in North Carolina. Now, in his address, the former president pledged to slash energy prices, hit the Biden administration over inflation, and claimed credit for lower insulin prices. But he also downplayed the importance of the economy as an election issue, even though polls show it's top of mind for most voters. They say it's the most important subject. I think crime is right there. I think the border is right there, for, personally. Uh, we have a lot of important subjects because our country has become a third world nation. They say it's the most important subject. I'm not sure it is, but they say it's the most important. Now, yesterday's speech from Mr. Trump also frequently veered into personal attacks against Harris and Biden in a potential preview of what we can expect from today's news conference, even as GOP allies urge him to stay focused on policy. Joe Biden is a very angry man. You know that, right? Because they they took it away from him. They usurped it. The most unpopular vice president in the history of our country. And then they decided to get politically correct. We have to put her in. They put her in. What happened to her laugh? I haven't heard that laugh in about a week. That's why they keep her off the stage. That's why she's disappeared. She's not smart. She's not intelligent. And we've gone through enough of that with this guy, Crooked Joe. Joining me now from the site of today's Biden-Harris event is NBC's Mike Memoli. And NBC's Vaughn Hilliard is in Bedminster ahead of the former president's news conference. Mike, let me start with you and this announcement on drug prices. Uh, who does it affect and how significant is this announcement? 
Well, Kristen, you were with me in the White House booth all those months in the first half of the Biden administration when we were covering the daily slog of trying to get the infrastructure bill, the Biden administration trying to get the components of that Build Back Better legislative package implemented. The president expended a significant amount of political capital. A lot of things had to fall out of that proposal as he worked to negotiate with Democrats. And so this piece, the, uh, allowing Medicare to negotiate with the pharmaceutical companies to lower the cri- prices of prescription drugs was one of the most hard-fought parts of that. And it's an, uh, it really underscores the story of Joe Biden as he talked about it today. It was the first bill he introduced as a freshman senator in 1973, 51 years ago. And so it, the, the president and the vice president rightly wanted to tout this moment now that this is finally uh, taking shape, coming into force. And it's going to benefit millions of Americans. One in seven older Americans will benefit from this. It's going to save the taxpayers $6 billion, according to the Biden administration, $1.5 billion in out-of-pocket costs that seniors will benefit from. And you're looking at that list there, some hundreds, even a few thousands of dollars in price reductions for drugs that cover everything from diabetes to uh, arthritis, colitis, a range of symptoms that so many Americans uh, are dealing with. It it doesn't take effect for for two more years, but... Under the on the terms of this law, this will be just the beginning of a series of, of drugs that will be negotiated each year that follows. And part of the message today was to make the point that Republicans, if they took office, both with President Trump uh, and a Republican Congress, would try to undo these proposals. And it was all about who you're fighting for against Big Pharma uh, is what the Democrats were saying uh, today. Well, and Mike, I remember those days in the White House booth with you very well <laughs> and very fondly, of course. Um, You know, I've been watching your reporting throughout the day, and one of the things that you've talked about is the choreography of this, the optics of this. How extraordinary, quite frankly, it is to see President Biden, Vice President Harris at the same event after he has now passed the torch to her. Talk a little bit about this delicate dance that Vice President Harris has to do right now. Well, it's worth repeating. This is such an unprecedented moment to have this kind of shakeup at the top of the Democratic ticket so close to the election. It's been uh, such a Herculean effort to try to make this as smooth as possible. And today was just another step along the way for the Biden team and the Harris team to show uh, that the Democrats are still united. It was so significant to see, as we see on screen there, Vice President Harris standing for the first time since she became the top of the Democratic ticket behind the seal of the president instead of the seal of the vice Vice President, which is what we've seen over the last three weeks. We saw her speak so glowingly, so praising of uh, the partner she's had in the White House for the last uh, th- three plus years. And really that uh, moving moment where you could see the president really the motion on his face as the crowd was chanting, thank you, Joe, encouraged Ooh. by the vice president in the process. There obviously has been a surge of enthusiasm from Democrats since Harris and Walls now are leading the ticket. But there are still pockets of Biden supporters and let's put it bluntly, Biden's themselves who have some mixed feelings about the way in which they felt he was treated. And so today is an important uh, beginning of that effort to make sure that those uh, you know, feelings are dealt with. And a big part of that also, of course, is going to be on Monday, the first day of the Democratic Convention, when we will hear uh, the latest of a farewell series of speeches from President Biden. Yeah, a big week coming up next week, that is for sure. The question is, can she keep the momentum going uh, through and after the Democratic National Convention? Mike Memoli, thank you so much for your great reporting there. Vaughn, let me turn to you. So, uh, look, we know that in his speech on the economy yesterday, former President Trump was urged to stay on message. He did in some parts of his speech, but he certainly veered into the personal attack zone in other parts of his speech. What were your big takeaways? Right. I mean, 48 hours ago, right, it was the likes of Nikki Haley that went on Fox to all but beg Donald Trump to not focus on Kamala Harris's race or crowd size, but instead focus on substance and policy. That is what led to yesterday's North Carolina rally. It was an event not dubbed to be a rally, even though it looked like one, but instead it was supposed to be an economic address. And as you noted, there were some mentions of the economy and some policy, but largely he went off topic again, personally attacking the likes of Kamala Harris. Harris. And he even said himself, he said that I was told, suggesting his campaign, it told him that the economy was the major issue of the campaign, but that he wasn't so 
Kushner himself. And to his point, you know, there is immigration, violent crime. There are other matters that Donald Trump has consistently come back to and has felt they like have been uh, 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 keen on making a key part of his campaign here. And we're now outside of his Bedminster Club, Kristen, where I can tell you that yesterday he didn't have props with him, but today there are Oreos, Uncrustables, and boxes of cereal in a clear indication that we are likely to expect him here at what is being dubbed a press event, a press conference, to talk about the grocery prices throughout the Biden administration and the high price that we have seen over the course of the last four years of those prices of those goods and grocery stores. Notably at a time, though, we have also seen inflation dip below now 3 percent, Kristen. Yeah, inflation now at its lowest level since early 2021. Vaughn, let me ask you, speaking of prices and what we heard from the pre former president yesterday, he said that he was responsible for lowering insulin costs. What's the fact check on that? Right. The fact check is that when he was president in 2020, he signed an executive order that would create a program that would allow some Medicare recipients to receive insulin at just a $35 cap. But what was different that would, took place under the Biden administration was an actual the codifying of a max of $35 uh, for all Medicare recipients, not just for some. And so we have seen Donald Trump uh, very upset at events like he was last night, in which he says that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are taking credit. But uh, for the Democratic administration, it was them that actually, through Congress, passed legislation that capped insulin at $35 for all Medicare recipients, not just some, as the executive order that was signed by mm. President, then President Trump did. Well, uh, breaking down all the facts there, before I let you go, uh, a little bit of a campaign uh, addition, a new addition, if you will. The campaign announcing it hired Corey Lewandowski, of course, famously of the 2016 campaign. What does this move signify? Uh, and, you know, Corey Lewandowski, just as Trump, is someone who's considered right. to be a counterpuncher. Right. This is the first time that Donald Trump has really had his back up against the wall of this 2024 cycle that he launched this bid back in November of 2022. And largely the two co-campaign managers for Donald Trump this go around, Susie Wiles and Chris LaCivita, have allowed Donald Trump to be Donald Trump. He is the one that has controlled his messaging and his efforts. And largely they have not kept anybody away from him. So we haven't seen that sort of infighting or palace intrigue that we did in 2016 or 2020. But now with now Donald Trump down in several key battleground state polls. You see Donald Trump here this afternoon welcoming his very first campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski, as well as other cold, old campaign hands back onto this 2024 campaign with now just two and a half months left. And so it's notable, Corey Lewandowski coming on as a senior advisor. He had actually been fired from the super PAC back in 2021 that was uh, allied with Donald Trump. And so really the question mark going forward at a time in which Donald Trump Trump is again seemingly controlling his own message despite the campaign, right? Uh, for example, yesterday billing that event as an economic address here. The question is, do some of these new uh, campaign advisors that are formally coming in, do they change the tone or the tenor or convince Donald Trump to run his campaign differently? I think there's a, a lot of questions that, frankly, uh, folks who are allied with Donald Trump are even looking for some clarity themselves. Kristen. Boy, it's going to be a fascinating stretch, Vaughn, and add to that list of questions, how is he going to interact with the likes of Chris Lasavita, Susie Wiles, Jason Miller, the folks who have been running the campaign thus far. Von Hilliard, thank you so much for all your great reporting. Good luck today in the press Thanks, conference. Bye -bye. We will be watching. Let's turn now to Chicago, where preparations are well underway ahead of next week's Democratic National Convention. Shaquille Brewster is there to preview it all. He joins me now. Shaq, great to see you. So let's talk about this. Set the stage for us. What kinds of preparations are taking place right now? Hi there, Kristen. Good to see you as well. And, you know, there are preparations that you can see and then those that are happening behind the scenes. I think around the United Center, you see these big metal fences that are being brought up all around the United Center. We know later this weekend, those vehicular screening barriers will start to come up as well. But behind the scenes, this is something that you have law enforcement saying that they've been preparing for for about two years now at this point. There's training that's been going on for months that we've been able to see that the police department has been doing. We know earlier 
earlier this week, we saw all of the agencies come together for a final uh, tabletop exercise, essentially a final exercise to make sure that they're all talking to one another. So uh, police department, you have local officials here saying that they are ready to secure what is a massive undertaking with this Democratic National Convention, Kristen. Well, and Shaq, part of that massive undertaking, of course, is that police, those who are going to be at the convention, all bracing for the fact that there will be protesters. What are police saying about that? Yeah. How are they planning for the protesters? No, great point there. And despite the legal battles that we've been seeing over the past couple of weeks and months, there was literally a court hearing today. Uh, you can expect there to be massive protests here in Chicago. The organizer of one of the coalition groups, the largest group that we know about, says that they're planning for about 20 to 25,000 protesters on Monday alone. I want you to listen to what the superintendent of Chicago's police department told me about that because he said he welcomes the peaceful protesters, but for those who are uh, have bad intentions he has a pretty clear message for them listen here so uh, do we want to clash with people absolutely not do we want to have fights in the streets with people absolutely not but i, I want to make one thing clear i want to make this perfectly clear we need to know the difference between rioting and protesting He told me his officers have received de-escalation training, training on First and Fourth Amendment. They also are having other departments come in to help backfill the secure yeah. zone so that it's Chicago Police Department officers that are out uh, interacting with the public, Kristen. Well, I'll see you there next week. Shaq Brewster, thank you so much. See and you soon. See you soon. And speaking of the DNC, we will be kicking off NBC's special coverage of the Democratic National Convention starting this Monday at 4 p.m. with a special edition of Meet the Press now live from Chicago. We will be there live through the convention. You do not want to miss it. And coming up, hoping for a breakthrough, my interview with the parents of an American hostage still being held by Hamas as negotiators look to broker an urgently needed ceasefire deal. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. We've reached another grim milestone in the Israel-Hamas war. The Hamas-run health ministry says the death toll in Gaza has now surpassed 40,000. We do want to stress NBC News cannot verify that number. But it comes as negotiators from the U.S., Israel, Egypt, and Qatar gathered in Doha for the latest round of ceasefire talks as they work desperately to salvage the framework laid out by President Biden almost three months ago now. Notably, Hamas says they will not send anyone to those talks. Yesterday, a top Hamas official said the group was losing faith in the U.S. as a mediator in those discussions. With me now is NBC News chief foreign affairs correspondent Andrea Mitchell and senior Washington court chief Washington correspondent as well. Thank you for being here. Good to be happy. So, Andrea, talk about these. What is the expectation? Hamas is not at the negotiating table, and yet there is so much urgency to get a deal. There is urgency to get a deal. The hostage families, as, as you discover when you talk to the hostage families, are desperate for a deal. But it is so unlikely. There's no, I mean, I would be mm. shocked if there is a deal. And U.S. officials are telling me they do not expect anything positive other than incremental change. What they have not been able to do is obviously get Hamas to do to release the hostages, which they could do at any time, but they've not been able to move Israel. And mm. that is primarily the prime minister and his very hard right coalition members. Uh, even the defense minister, Gallant, uh, criticizing Netanyahu and Netanyahu criticizing him, it's now out in the open, for moving the goalpost and for creating new obstacles even after this agreement from May 1st mm. had been announced. Help people understand, Andrea, because th these talks have stopped and started and stopped and started. You've been tracking every single development. What are the biggest sticking points at this time? Is it about what happens once this war winds down? Well, it's, first of all, Netanyahu is saying that he still has yet to achieve the main goals in Gaza. The U.S. and the IDF and the defense ministers say that's not true, mm. that they have accomplished what they have accomplished. They don't have sin more, but they have basically reduced the fighting capability of Hamas. John Kirby repeated that again today with me. But the clouds, as he described it to me today, uh, hanging over this are, he acknowledged, 
the assassination mm. of the Hamas negotiator, Hania. He's a terrorist, a terrorist leader. He's the Hamas leader, but he was living in Ghadar. He was present uh, behind the scenes at the talks and traveled extensively, wasn't you know, eliminated, and he was killed in Tehran. So now there is the threat from the supreme leader in Iran to retaliate at any moment. And that certainly is a big thing, as well as he acknowledged other actions Israel has taken recently, and those actions are demanding control of the area in Gaza along the border with Egypt, known as the Philadelphia Corridor, and also how to decide moving the Hamas feeder, fighters from the south back to the north. Andrea, very quickly, in terms of the threat from Iran, what is your latest reporting about when and whether that is going to happen? The U.S. does not know. Yeah. Israel does not know. Their hope is that this huge deployment of U.S. military force will be one deterrent, as well as diplomatic pressure, including they engage China, China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi calling Iran and everyone, to a certain extent, a greater and lesser extent, maybe China, not so much, mm -hmm. uh, urging don't escalate beyond a certain tolerable amount. But the, the, the fact is they believe there has to be some military action. They cannot tolerate an assassination of an Hamas leader mm -hmm. in the capital only hours after meeting with the Ayatollah, uh, that there's going to be something and it, how big it's going to be remains to be seen. Well, we know that you will continue to track every single development. Andrea, thank you so much for being here. It's, it's great, great to, to be with you. It's great to see you. Really appreciate it. And among the hostages that would be a part of any ceasefire deal reached in Doha are eight Americans, five of whom are still believed to be alive. Earlier today, I spoke to the parents of one of those Americans, Hirsch Goldberg Polin, who was taken by Hamas on October 7th and has been held hostage now for 314 days. I began by asking his parents about their level of optimism that the ongoing talks in Doha, what I was just talking to Andrea about, could lead to a breakthrough, and when they last heard from the administration on the status of those talks. We were in touch with the administration um, exactly six days ago on uh, Friday, and um, that's the last direct communication that the U.S. families have had that I'm aware of. You know, there are eight Americans still being held hostage among the 115 hostages who hail from 23 different countries total. Um, and in terms of how optimistic we are, we are always trying to stay optimistic and hopeful, and we are in a constant state of extreme ambiguous trauma, as anyone who is a parent or has ever had a parent can imagine. And so we try to remain realistic and positive and yet we've been in this excruciating place now for almost 11 months. As you know, Hamas is not attending this latest round of talks. Does that concern you that Hamas is not going to be at the table? Or do you think potentially that could allow an actual breakthrough to happen? Uh, I mean, Hamas has been represented pretty consistently by some combination of the Qataris and the Egyptians, and that's the case today and tomorrow as well. Ultimately, what we need to happen, and we need it to happen immediately, is what are called proximity talks. We're waiting for the time when Israeli representatives and Hamas representatives are sitting in adjoining rooms and mediators are literally going back and forth to finalize every detail. And we're really hoping that coming out of the talks today and tomorrow, it immediately proceeds to those proximity talks. I don't know if even for those, Hamas will actually have people in the room or will be their Qatari and Egyptian mediators. But um, that's what we're shooting for. And whoever it is who can speak today on behalf of Hamas, that's who we need at the table. And that's what we're shooting for. Mm. I want to ask you about some of our latest reporting. NBC News has confirmed that Prime Minister Netanyahu has uh, apparently added some new conditions, which may have complicated negotiations. A uh, Middle Eastern official telling our reporters that when proposals were taken back to Jerusalem, Prime Minister Netanyahu then, quote unquote, moved the goalposts. What's your reaction to hearing that? Uh, do you accept that characterization? 
Well, we're not privy to the details that are in the actual deal. And so we are kind of at the mercy as most of the masses are of getting our information from the media, from the press, and it depends who you're reading or who you're watching. So we don't know what's real and what's not real. Um, if indeed anyone is playing games and moving goalposts and creating drama and theater for reasons that are not in the best interests of all of the innocent people who are caught in the crosshairs of this horrifying tragedy. Mm -hmm. So that's not just the 115 hostages and all of their families, but it's also hundreds of thousands of innocent people in the entire region. I mean, the Gazan people need relief desperately as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that at this point, we really need everyone who is a responsible leader and elected official to be the grown up in the room to do what is right. Looking ahead to next week, you are, it's my understanding, planning to attend the Democratic National Convention. Talk a little bit, if you will, both of you about that decision and what are you hoping to hear from Democratic leaders? What do you want to hear from them? Well, it's an interesting transition period for the Democrats, but what's relevant for us and the hostage families is that President Biden and Vice President Harris and the Republican candidate, Donald Trump, all three of them have been consistent with their messaging. Now is the time to do a deal. We cannot miss mm. this opportunity. And so we are um, hoping to hear that the Harris campaign, the Harris Walls campaign is going to be pushing that message hard, that they're not gonna be letting their feet off the gas in the transition from President Biden to a Harris administration potentially. Um, and we're really looking for them to continue to hammer the message and the actions that they've been doing, which is number one, we need to release these hostages. We need to bring them home. As part of that, the expectation is there's gonna be a halt or a ceasefire that's going to offer much needed relief to Gazan civilians. And in general, decreased tension in this region. We've got the Hezbollah heating up in the north. We've got the Houthis. We've got Iranian threats. And it's such a tense, stressful time. And we are in the same camp as the Americans and Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield spoke about this at the United Nations yesterday. The singular event that can reduce tension in this region most immediately is to do a deal to release the hostages and have all the other things become less tense as part of that. I'll add to that, by the way, that it's very clear that the hostage issue is not a political issue. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to this convention as people pleading for a humanitarian relief in this region that is not politically based. We've had tremendous support, bipartisan support, which we've been so heartened by and has been really helpful to all of the hostage families. Well, we will end it on those powerful points and our thoughts are with your precious Hirsch and your entire family at this incredibly difficult time. Thank you for taking time to speak to us, Rachel and John Pullen. We really appreciate it. Thank you for sharing your family story. Thank you, Kristen, Kristen. Thank you for telling this important story to the American people. Well, as we mentioned, we are waiting for former President Trump to start his press conference in New Jersey. We will take you there when that happens. That is coming up. Stay with us. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Another day, another set of polls showing momentum and movement in Democrats' favor since the change at the top of the ticket. Check out these new numbers in battleground state Senate races from our friends at the Cook Political Report. Democratic Senate candidates in Nevada, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Michigan, and Wisconsin with big leads over their Republican opponents, most of them gaining on their margin since May. And in each of these states, the Democrat is at or above the all-important 50% mark, and hopefully we will get those numbers to you in just a minute. But there is a major caveat to remember when talking about the race for the Senate. 
Even if Democrats win in all of those races, they are facing an incredibly difficult Senate map. All of the Republican-held seats that are up for re-election are in red states, whereas Democrats are defending multiple seats in red states. John Tester, for example, Sherrod Brown, are running for re-election in Montana and Ohio. And what was Joe Manchin's seat is now open in West Virginia. Democrats can only afford to lose one of those races if they want to keep control of the Senate in a potential Harris administration. Joining me now to go over all of the state of the race and the Senate battlegrounds is Jessica Taylor. She is uh, the Senate and uh, editor at the Cook Political Report. Jessica, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So let's start with the new polls in the battleground states. Democrats are leading Senate races across the board. Most of their leads have increased since Harris mm -hmm. replaced Biden at the top of the ticket. How do you see the overall state of play? Well, as you mentioned, it's the three states. You know, this is part of our um, battle, our swing state project at Cook Political Report with a Democratic firm, uh, BSG, and a Republican firm, GS Strategies, that we're doing periodically. And uh, but it's those other states that could really or really make up the crux of it. You know, I think that it's good news for Democrats certainly that they are leading in these swing states, and that in many cases they are outperforming Harris. Even before the switch at the top of the ticket, they were outrunning Biden. Um, even in our poll in May and other polls that I had seen, even when Biden was at his worst. So that was good news for Democrats. But it really comes down to, you mentioned the West Virginia seat. Democrats have a 51-49 majority, but I think of this as 50-50 because Democrats concede that that open West Virginia seat is going to go to Republicans. Uh, John Tester remains the most in trouble. We've seen a couple of polls come out recently that he is down to his Republican opponent, Tim Sheehy. He needs to outrun Harris by, you know, this is a state that Trump won by 16. Could those margins increase? That just becomes increasingly difficult. In, in Ohio, um, another one that we did not poll, but other polls have shown that Sherrod Brown is ahead by single digits. But when you look at these other states that would grow a potential Republican majority, that's good news for Democrats that, you know, because it, it, Republicans I was talking to when Biden was at his worst were thinking, you know, we could get to 54, 55 seats, and that gives you a much more flexible majority to do things with. But you're seeing, again, double digit leads in Pennsylvania and Nevada. No Notably, Nevada in our survey was the only state where Harris is currently behind. Now, I don't think uh, Jackie Rosen leading her Republican opponent there, Sam Brown, that's going to be an 18-point race, but certainly a very good trajectory for her. And based on that, and uh, fundraising edge is also key for Democrats in these states. They've been able to cement some of these early leads because they have such um, money advantage. They've been on the air early, and that's helped them build these leads going into the, the crucial campaign season post-Labor Day. Yeah, let me ask you and follow up with you on the state of Nevada, because, as you say, you have the Senate race, mm -hmm. Rosen is ahead, but in the presidential race, Trump is ahead. Should Democrats write off Nevada at the presidential level, or do you think that it's still gettable for Harris? I mean, the fact that it's close is, is good. You know, she is still within the margin of error. Mm -hmm. Um, in our poll at this juncture, you know, that had been as Trump plus nine state in May. Now it's Trump plus three. So it's still gettable. And I think you're going to see them invest resources there. Um, but, you know, I think that at the Senate level, at least, what we are seeing is a lot of women independent voters moving. And that's good news for Harris as well. I think the issue of abortion, mm -hmm. that's, this is another state where abortion is going to be on the ballot to codify that into the Nevada state constitution. That's driving a lot of these voters. You've seen her opponent, Sam. Brown, um, a former Army captain, uh, go out with an ad this week where he's very much on the defensive on abortion, emphasizing that he would not back a national abortion ban. So the movement that we've seen in these Senate races, it's a lot of independent women. It's a lot of non-college women, too. So it's not just these college-educated suburban women, especially on issues with abortion. Um, that's something that we are seeing a split in these Senate races between that and the presidential race. And of course, it's on the ballot in Arizona as well now. Uh, when you think about the race in Arizona, Carrie Lake, when you think about North Carolina, Mark Robinson, how could those candidates impact Trump's standing in those races? I mean, they're behind where he is. And I think they, mm. they can, it, well, actually all of these Republican candidates are running behind Trump. So that gives them room to grow there. But I think someone like Carrie Lake, where she has uh, her 
unfavorables really are baked in from that controversial uh, race for governor that I think she is, there's just opinions about her. And then you, you mentioned that in important uh, North Carolina governor's race. We had this race tied in May. Now Josh Stein, the Democrat, the attorney general is up by eight points there, 48 to 40. And again, that's the movement we've seen, particularly among non-college women in, in that poll. And so I think, again, issues of abortion, Stein has just been crushing Robinson on air using his own video own words, he said, um, demeaning comments about women and on abortion. Robinson, another candidate that has gone up on with a defensive ad on abortion with his wife talking about the abortion that they had um, before they were married. Mm. And of course, former President Trump was just in North Carolina. Harris will be there on Friday. Thank you so much for joining us, Jessica. Really appreciate it. Let's head out to Bedminster now because former President Trump is approaching the podium. We have a lot of... Uh interesting things to talk about and we have some very specific things so uh we'll take our time we have plenty of time i think you have plenty of time i hope you like the weather it's very nice nice place nice location and i do thank you for being here and we don't have very much heat so i say it's perfect weather for this uh where uh, the rain is not imminent based on the fact that there are no clouds so it's really nice. It's really nice. And uh, let's go over some big facts and some very substantial truths about where we stand as a country, because we're a failing nation because of the way it's been run for the last three and a half years. We're a failing nation. People are coming into our country by the millions and millions and millions. We have no idea who they are, where they come from. But we're also a failing economy. Kamala Harris is a radical California liberal who broke the economy, broke the border, and broke the world, frankly. Very destructive to the entire world because as we go, oftentimes the world goes. She destroys everything she touches. And if she wins, your finances and your country will never recover. You're never going to recover. A radical left person wants to put price controls all over the place, which will end up driving up your prices, not down your prices. Harris has just declared that tackling inflation will be a day one priority for her. It's going to be day one. But day one, really, for Kamala was three and a half years ago. Where has she been? And why hasn't she done it? Why hasn't she done it? I hear her complaining all the time. She was the border czar, but she didn't do anything. It's the worst border czar in history. There's never been a border czar so bad. She's been unbelievable in terms of her badness to some of our allies, some of our great allies. You know who I'm talking about. Here is the record of economic calamity that Kamala is desperate for voters to ignore. She cast the tie-breaking votes that caused record inflation. She cast the votes. She's trying to blame Biden, as you know. So it was Biden, but I'm going to do a better job. But it was her. And if she wants to do a better job, she's still got five months left, right? But she can't do a better job because she doesn't know how to. And she's of a she's of a place in life where she wouldn't know what a better job is. Going to destroy our country. And as a result of Kamala's inflation price hikes, they've cost a typical household a total of twenty eight thousand dollars. These are numbers coming from government. They're not coming from me. Twenty eight thousand dollars. She's cost the typical household. Kamala's inflation nightmare continues to cost the average American family one thousand one hundred dollars every single month. One thousand one hundred dollars. Again, government numbers. You're paying one hundred and forty eight dollars more a month on food. That's every month. Average family because Kamala and her ideas, and Joe Biden, too. I, I mentioned him, but he's sort of gonzo. It all started with the debate. I should have been a little bit easier. Somebody said, your debate performance was horrible. I said, why? Because you forced him out of government. But I believe she'll be just as bad. I believe she's maybe in many ways going to be worse because he wasn't really a radical left. Uh, but she is. She's real. He wasn't real. So I think she's going to be, in many ways, easier to beat than Joe Biden. What they did to him was disgraceful, by the way. And it really is a threat to democracy. It was a coup by people that wanted him out. 
and they didn't do the way, not the way they're supposed to do it. $129 more on energy and $241 more. This is all per month on rent. So you have that, 148, 129, 241, and then many other increases. You add it all up, it's thousands and thousands of dollars that she and he have cost people. The cost of a typical monthly mortgage has doubled since I left office, and that number was about three months old from government, and now it's tripled. We had mortgage rates at around 2%, close to 2%, and they're now at 10%, and you can't get a mortgage. So that means it's a lot higher than 10%. I guess it is whatever, whenever they want to give over the money, and that's a lot more than 10%. So when you think about double, they've actually quadrupled or more than that. Think of that, quadrupled, which really kills the American dream for young people. Young people are being devastated by what they've done to our country. Grocery prices have skyrocketed. Cereals are up 26 percent. Bread is up 24 percent. Butter is up 37 percent. Baby formula is up 30 percent. Flour is up 38 percent. And eggs are up 46 percent. And many items are up at much higher rates than that. Now Kamala is reportedly proposing communist price controls. She wants price controls. And if they worked, I'd go along with it, too, but they don't work. They actually have the exact opposite impact and effect. But it leads to food shortages, rationing, hunger, dramatically more inflation. Their Inflation Reduction Act, by the way, was a disaster. It's what caused the inflation. Their Inflation Reduction Act was a con job. They actually admitted that it wasn't really for inflation that they did it. They don't know why they did it, but uh, they named it the Inflation Reduction Act, which was a very nice name. Got approved based on that. Unfortunately, people didn't understand it. I understood it. I said, that's going to cause tremendous inflation, and it did, among other things, like energy. She's running on the Maduro plan. We call it the Maduro plan, like something straight out of Venezuela or the Soviet Union. This announcement is an admission that her economic policies have totally failed and caused really a catastrophe for our country, and beyond that, a catastrophe in the world. Uh, a little bit unrelated, but not totally unrelated. We have wars breaking out in the Middle East. We have the horrible war going on with Ukraine and Russia. All these things would have never happened if I was president, would have never, ever happened. And they didn't happen. Since Harris took office, car insurance is up 55 percent, and they just announced it's going to be substantially higher than that within the next week. They expect big increases in car insurance. It's out of control, and insurance generally. Thanks to Kamala's war on American energy, electricity prices are up 32 percent. Gasoline prices are up 50 percent and going higher. Meanwhile, real incomes are down by over $2,000 a year. So they're, the incomes for people are down 2000 on average a year, government numbers. The typical American has seen a 4 percent pay cut under Kamala and Biden, Crooked Joe, Crooked Joe Biden. Credit card debt has exploded by 50 percent under Harris to a record high. It's now at a record high. It's never been anywhere close since March. And by the way, people are going to have to start paying that, and it's not going to be a pretty sight for the next period of time. It could be a substantial time. Since March of 2022... You're listening to former President Trump, who is beginning his second news conference in as many weeks at his Bedminster Golf Resort. They are hitting Vice President Harris on the economy. Uh, of course, if you look at the polls, former President Trump actually rates higher. Uh, Americans say they have more trust in him to handle the economy. So that's why you see the focus on that issue. Uh, a couple of fact checks we just want to make out at the top here before I start my panel discussion. Uh, he was talking about the rate at which prices have increased. It is worth noting that inflation has actually slowed. It's at its lowest level since 2021. Uh, prices on all food items are up 2.2% as compared to a year ago. It's not entirely clear 
what the benchmarks are that former President Trump was using, where exactly he was getting his data from. For example, he said that butter was up over 30 uh, percent. Based on uh, the data that we have, it's up 6.1 percent. So, yes, we are seeing price increases. Uh, but it, again, is worth noting that inflation is at its lowest level since 2021. He also accused Democrats of pulling off a coup. Uh, of course, there's nothing unconstitutional about replacing the person at the top of the ticket prior to the convention. Uh, and then just finally, he said that the foreign entanglements uh, that are unfolding across the globe wouldn't have happened if he were in office. Of course, no way to categorically prove that point. Just a few of the fact checks as we begin today's panel discussion. Francesca Chambers, who's White House correspondent for USA Today, Juanita Tolliver, Democratic strategist and NBC News political analyst, and Brendan Buck, former advisor to Republican House speakers Paul Ryan and John Boehner. He is also an NBC News political analyst. Thanks to all of you. I'm sure I left some fact checks <laughs> on the table there. Tried to get a few of them. Um, Francesca, mm -hmm. just zoom out a little bit. Right. Here he is holding another press conference. He's clearly trying to stay on message. His advisors are urging him to stay on message because, of course, we have seen him veer off message in their uh, opinion in recent weeks, as we've seen Vice President Harris's poll numbers rise. He's made a number of personal attacks against her, questioned her intelligence. Today is clearly an attempt to reset. And yet, the question portion hasn't started yet. And that's where things could get a little interesting. But it's also an attempt to stay in the news. And we and we see this with candidates mm -hmm. all of the time, that they don't want to take questions when they're in control of the narrative. They feel like things are going well for them. So I do think it is a reflection on Donald Trump and how they view this campaign going at this point that he is now holding, as you noted, his second press conference in recent weeks. When you talk about, though, the, the prices that he was referencing there, the Harris campaign isn't disputing that the prices are higher than what they were. Indeed, that's why she's going to be putting out these plans tomorrow. What they're disputing is what caused those price increases and what would these two candidates mm -hmm. do differently? She's going to come at it by talking about what they call price gouging and talk about the Federal Trade Commission. And what he's saying it is, is the Inflation Reduction Act. And Republicans have said they want to repeal that. Mm -hmm. Brendan, what's your take? What do you make of this strategy that we're seeing? We should note we are going to go back to Trump when he starts taking questions. Yeah, I mean, for all the Republicans who've been asking him to get on message, I think there's a lot of them who are cheering what they just saw. That was extremely focused on the issue that voters overwhelmingly say is the most important, the economy. And inflation, of course, driving that. And if you want to keep him focused, surround him with props so he kind of has to stay focused on it. <laughs> right. um, but that is, the, that is the, the primary issue that people have angst of the economy with. Prices have gone up a lot, and we can dispute how much they've gone mm -hmm. up, but, but it's a lot and people are, are unhappy about it. And Kamala Harris doesn't have a great answer for that. She can talk about price gouging. That's not a real solution. That's a political answer. And I think everybody knows that. And presidents have been talking about going after price gouging for years. It's not, it's not a thing. It's not anything that you can really do. It's the best she has. It may be what she can work with. I don't know that she wants to necessarily get into a dispute about that, though. It's not also the only thing she has, right? The other split screen moment of the day was Vice President Harris and President Biden on the trail touting how they've lowered prescription drug costs. They are talking about what their administration done. And for the vice president to be able to say, I cast that deciding uh, tie break vote in the Senate as well, it demonstrates her ability to deliver something for the people, not just rant in a monotone and shout things that require repeated fact checks. And I, I do want to also, on the fact check point, I, I feel like at this point, it's, it's got to be a public service to have that running ticker. Every time he says something, <laughs> we need a full team checking it. Because NPR reported 165 lies in his previous press conference at Mar-a-Lago four days ago. And so I think that's also something that, that needs to be done. Uh, one of the backdrops to this decision to hold a press conference by the Trump team is that Vice President Harris, uh, Francesca, has not yet held a press conference. Mm -hmm. She has not sat for a long interview. The Republicans are really trying to put the pressure on her for that. They think that if she does that, there will be some type of slip up that will allow them to have an opening. But at some point, she is going to do it. But talk about what your reporting tells you inside the Harris camp. How soon is that going to happen? What are you What are you hearing? Well, that's what I was referring to before. As far as Democrats are concerned, why would she need to do something like that, right? <laughs> like she has, you know, the polling's been going well for her. She's had the momentum so far. When you have Donald Trump, who's out there and he is holding a, a press conference or having these rallies, and he is saying some of the things that led Republicans and independents in the last president campaign to, to ditch him for Joe Biden, 
Why mm. would Democrats think that they, they need to do something like that? Now, of course, we would love we it if she had a race. I mean, I have we many questions asking. I would like to ask Vice yes. President Kamala Harris, of course. But from a strategic standpoint, when they're looking at that polling in the battleground states, and she is doing better than President Biden was in many of them, they haven't seen the need clearly to do one so far. I also want to add to that. We still haven't gone back to Trump. He's still not taking questions, right? Like, I think that part is also reality here. But when I think about Vice President Harris, even though she hasn't done interviews, she has been in front of millions of voters every day since July 21st. It's not the same, though. I mean, sure, you know, he is but a... Trump has not. We're not back on Trump yet. Still no questions. And asked. it's also not the same to do. <laughs> and, and she does talk to reporters on the plane off the record that's on right. a regular right. basis. That's but, that's also, but that's also not the same because I can't tell you what she said. <laughs> that is true. And Trump has said he is going to answer questions today. So, again, we will go back to that <laughs> when it happens. Brendan Buck, he has brought on Corey Lewandowski back into the fold. A lot of people surprised to see that. He is someone who is, quite frankly, a controversial campaign staffer back in 2016. He's had an on-again, off-again relationship with the Trump world. But here he is as a senior advisor in his campaign. How do you think that's going to play? Will he help Trump to be more disciplined? Well, I think it's obviously a sign that there's some trouble in paradise. You don't mm. bring in your yeah. ex-campaign manager <laughs> if you're happy with your current well, campaign you fired. manager. Yeah, who was, who was removed. Um, for improper touching of a, of a woman, a donor of, of, of Donald Trump. So this is, I don't think you can spin this as a, as a good sign. Um, this is also, but I think it, you know, obviously Trump has had some, some troubles in, in tr figuring out how to move forward with the, the change of, of candidates, so he feels like he needs a change. What's strange is that this is just all a throwback. Everything is a rerun. It's always mm -hmm. the same old characters. Mm -hmm. It's never anything new or fresh. I don't know exactly what Corey, Lew Corey Lewandowski brings that is more appealing than it was in, in 2016. He just likes to have people who are around him who make him feel comfortable, who remind him of the good old days. I don't think there's much strategic value to this. It's probably more just a comfort blanket. It's probably not a decision by his campaign people. Let's keep him happy. Let's throw him a bone. Let's give him somebody that, that he's familiar with. Yeah. We are going to, of course, see Vice President Harris on the trail, as you mentioned. And tomorrow she's going to be in North Carolina talking about this price gouging initiative. Um, how much meat does she need to start putting mm -hmm. on the bones, notwithstanding interviews mm -hmm. and press conferences? How much do you think voters, Francesca, are hungry to hear the details of her policies? Does she need to start filling in some of the blanks more quickly? Well, I've been warned that that is not what we should necessarily expect over the next week, not even necessarily in her Democratic mm. National Convention speech. Mm. Democrats are seeing that more as like a party unity moment, mm. a rah-rah, get the momentum behind her. And also recall that her campaign is now put in a new ad buy, a $90 million ad buy that will be used to uplift her message coming out of the convention. So it's, it's unclear when we might hear some of those more detailed plans, although I know that they have been soliciting ideas for them from Democrats mm. so far. I have some degree of sympathy for having to put together a campaign right. in, a, in a short <laughs> amount of time. But at the same time, this is all very sort of unsettling. Like, mm. if, you're, if you've been talking about the importance of democracy for many years and, and you think that this is at risk, uh, telling voters what you're for and answering questions from the press is pretty fundamental and basic to that. And I know that you can say that Donald Trump doesn't answer enough questions, but we should never lower our standards to what Donald Trump Oh, does. I agree. Never so lower the, that. <laughs> So beyond just sort of like it's the right thing to do, yeah. tell people what you're going to do, uh, there's, a, I think, a political benefit to going out and maybe doing a good interview. Doing a good interview is a good campaign tactic. Yeah. Telling people that you have a policy that, that's going to appeal to them is a good campaign tactic. I think it shows a lack of confidence in her no, as a candidate disagree. that they won't put her out there and, and do a, a good interview. It's not hard to do if you're a good candidate. It, it doesn't necessarily help you in the long term either. Recall that Ron DeSantis said after his campaign that he, a bad wished candidate. He, did, he wished that he had <laughs> engaged with the media more and earlier. Well, I think the other reality is let's keep watching for what does come because I know those conversations are happening. I know that the different groups who have special interests in advocacy campaigns are engaging with the Harris campaign. And so I fully expect something with Bones. Well, obviously, there's a lot of focus on the VP nominees yes. as well. I'm not going to toss the sound because at any moment we could have to go back to Donald Trump. But these remarks from 2021 have resurfaced from J.D. Vance. I'll just read them, get everyone's reaction on the other side. He said, when the big corporations come against you for passing abortion restrictions, when corporations are so desperate for cheap labor, they don't want people to parent children 
children. She's right to say abortion restrictions are bad for business of his, whoever was interviewing him. And what that means for those of us who want to protect the dignity of the unborn is that we should be for abortion restrictions, even if they are bad for business. How damaging are these comments, do you think, in an election where we have seen abortion rights are quite energizing? Well, I haven't seen the full comments yeah. that J.D. JD Mance made. That being said, abortion rights has, to your point, been very energizing. Earlier you were talking about these races up and down the ballot, the Senate, the Senate races as well in Nevada. This was the playbook that they ran in 2022 when Catherine Cortez Masto was able to eke out a narrow win. This is what we're seeing with uh, Jackie Rose in the cycle, too. This is how Kamala Harris and her campaign believe that they will win in Nevada, mm -hmm. too. Yeah, what do you make of it? Uh, you know, in the context, I think it's important to appreciate that's when he was trying to win a primary to, be, to become a senator. And yes. I, I think he has shown himself to be something of a chameleon. You know, he's trying to figure out what is it that Republicans want to hear. He was a never Trumper for a while, and then he decided, I'm going to run for Senate in Ohio, and I got to win a primary, so I'm going to start saying. And the way he talks about these things, I've been in Republican politics for a long time, the way he talks about these things is jarring still. Mm -hmm. That is not the way you typically hear a pro life person talking. And it seems like he's playing a character, what he thinks a conservative wants to hear. And so he uses this very over the top language that, of course, is going to come back and bite him at some point. Yeah. Well, you know, abortion, the issue of reproductive rights, now on the ballot in eight different states. How do you think overall, and do you think Democrats are doing enough to capitalize on that? Oh, I know the local abortion groups that have been pushing these ballot measures for months and years are absolutely doing the groundwork, because we know that these issues are something that they collect signatures from individuals across partisan lines, across gender lines, across age. And so this has broad appeal, just like we saw in 2022, 2023. I fully expect voters to cross partisan lines and gender lines to support these type of measures, and that will undoubtedly give Democrats a boost in November. All right, you guys, thank you so much. And again, uh, we will be going back to former President Trump once he starts uh, answering questions, which we anticipate will happen very soon. So stay tuned for that. Francesca, Juanita, Brendan, thank you all for being here. Thank you for the great conversation. We are back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. The news continues with Tom Costello in for Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.